Hi, this is Tony Williams, a senior fellow at the Bill of Rights Institute, and we would like to welcome you to another episode of our BRI Scholar Talks. Today, we are going to dive into the 19th century statesman John Calhoun and his philosophy of concurrent majorities. To help us make sense of these views is Professor James Reed. James Reed is a professor of political science at the College of St. Benedict, St. John's University since 1988. He earned degrees from the University of Chicago and Harvard University. And Dr. Reed is the author of several books, including Majority Rule Versus Consensus, The Political Thought of John C. Calhoun, which I just happen to have a copy of, and it's excellent, I'm finishing it right now. And also Power Versus Liberty, Madison, Hamilton, Wilson, and Jefferson. And also a very interesting book called Doorstep Democracy, Face-to-Face -face Politics in the Heartland. He is currently working on a book on Lincoln's political thought and the principle of majority rule. That last book sounds very relevant, strongly needed in, in our divisive times. I think we need more of that face-to-face -face politics, uh, you know, talking over a uh, coffee or proverbial beer with your neighbor about politics rather mm -hmm. than the, the divisiveness you see on social media. But we're here to, to focus on the topic of John Calhoun's consensus majority views and how it may have conflicted with the constitutional ideas of James Madison. And, and the other founders. Uh, in your uh, not only fantastic book, but your excellent essay you wrote on the topic for BRI's new textbook, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. James, thank you for joining us. All right, well, thank you, uh, Tony, for this interview, and thank you to the Bill of Rights Institute for the work that you do for education in America's uh, history and constitution and founding principles. So in Federalist 10, 39, 51, James Madison writes extensively about majority rule, the Republican principle. In his first inaugural address, Thomas Jefferson stated, all two will bear in mind the sacred principle that though the will of the majority is in all cases to prevail, that will to be rightful must mm -hmm. be reasonable. So as you were saying, uh, you know, can you help us understand a, a little bit more on, on how Madison and the founders really understood the principles of, of Republican self-government and majority rule to, to really be foundational? James Madison, also Thomas Jefferson, would have acknowledged that it's possible for majorities to act unjustly. So the question is, but at the same time, both Madison and Jefferson, as we found with, with, find with Lincoln later, believed that there was no place other than the majority that you could rightfully put the final power of decision in a government that's based on the sovereignty of the people. So the question is, how do you make the majority more re reasonable? Uh, as to use uh, Jefferson's term. And uh, particularly uh, Madison in Federalist 10 and Federalist 51 gave a very famous answer to that question that Calhoun understood and strongly disagreed with. So let me describe Madison's answer and then uh, Calhoun's disagreement with it. Madison's answer in Federalist 10 and in Federalist 51 was that if you have a, a uh, uh, popular form of government that's over an extensive territory, so larger than a state, you're going to um, take into account many different interests. So the, the problem for uh, uh, Madison talked about a majority faction, an unjust majority. He believed that was much more likely to happen at a state or local level, where you might have just two, you know, really entrenched interests uh, facing each other down on different sides of the tracks, right? Um, whereas if you take into account the entire United States, uh, in New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, South Carolina, Massachusetts, uh, and then further uh, diversity as we move westward, uh, his argument was that no one faction, and it, by faction is he meant uh, a group, a very a group that was animated by, by a uh, a single impulse of passion or a single shared interest uh, that w came at the expense of the interests of fellow citizens. That it, you were much less likely to have a single majority faction over the territory of the whole United States than you were at a state or a local level. Madison did, however, uh, 
understand you needed to form a majority. You couldn't govern. You couldn't get legislation passed through the House and Senate if you didn't have a majority. He believed that those majorities would be formed through a deliberative process uh, where each, um, each uh, US rep, each senator, although they may have their own special interests that they represent from their state, most of them uh, would be at least relatively impartial toward the claims of other states and other regions. And so uh, you, rather than a tightly formed faction, you would have a deliberative process and a majority would form, and then a different issue would come along and a different majority, a majority with a different composition would come along. So uh, uh, Madison really depended upon House and Senate uh, being deliberative bodies where people listen and work out the common good. Um, let me now contrast that with what Calhoun said. Um, Calhoun, in a sense, Calhoun's answer to this and his critique of Madison, uh, his critique of Federalist 10 and Federalist 50, uh, 51, which at that time, uh, it wasn't clear, officially clear who had written them, but he, he, he addresses Federalist 10 and Federalist 51. He said that might have been true at the beginning, but that was before the formation of national political parties. And national political parties, you know, interestingly, um, came along, uh, Madison did not did not anticipate and certainly did not want national political parties. Uh, but a number of issues came along in the 1790s where then uh, Madison and Jefferson himself and then Alexander Hamilton on the other side of the uh, political divisions formed national political parties. Uh, they, they dissolved after that, uh, but then were reformed in the late uh, uh, 1820s, the Jacksonian parties followed by the Whig party. And um, so what, what Calhoun argued is that the action of the federal government over time and the, the enormous stakes that each regional interest has in getting what it wants out of the policy of, of the federal government will cause these national political coalitions to form. It may take a long time for them to form, but once they're formed, they can become the kind of tightly knit, uncompromising, potentially very unjust factions that, that Madison believed could be prevented uh, at the national level, and, uh, but did not anticipate these you know, enormous, ideologically driven political parties. So that's how Calhoun believed you could have entrenched majorities, majority faction and minority factions over the whole United States in ways that would really um, uh, call into question whether the kind of uh, solution that Madison prescribed in Federalist 10 and Federalist 51 could actually work. And, and maybe we can take a step back for our students and just provide a little bit of background on, on who John Calhoun was and, and maybe a few of his, the, you know, the offices that he held uh, okay. and, and maybe some of the influences. You know, when we talked about Madison and Jefferson, how do, how do the 1798 Virginia and Kentucky resolutions kind of help shape his thinking? Okay, and let me describe a little bit about his life. He was born 1782, which is right near the end of the Revolutionary War. So we would call him a second generation statesman, you know, the, the generation that follows the, the, the framers of, of the Constitution and the signers of the Declaration of Independence. He died in 1850, which was 10 years before uh, session, secession and civil war, but when that was already on the horizon. Um, he was a Southern slaveholder uh, from South Carolina. Uh, he seems never to have questioned the justice of slaveholding. Uh, in his early years, he, interestingly, he was, uh, he was educated in the North uh, at Yale. Um, but then returned back south, was in Congress during the War of 1812, and 
in his early career was very much a nationalist, a, very, a, a strong advocate of, of federal power. He believed in using federal power to build roads and canals. These were called internal improvements in those days. He favored a tariff that was mildly protective. Now, it, it was different from the ones that he supported later, that he opposed later, but he did support a tariff at that time. And he was on good terms with uh, Northern politicians, including John Quincy Adams and others. So um, he uh, served in uh, the U.S. House during the 18 teens. And then he was Secretary of War for, for President James Monroe, which uh, there was not any, any major wars at the time, but he had really important role in creating the system of forts, including what's now Fort Snelling in Minnesota. Um, and, uh, and also informing a uh, policy toward American Indians, um, during that period. Uh, he was elected vice president, uh, in the 18th, the very, uh, uh, divided, uh, three, uh, three-way race of the 1824 presidential election. He was elected vice president, uh, under John Quincy Adams, but very soon became a, uh, a political opponent of John Quincy Adams, the political opponent of the of the president whom he was serving. Well, he wouldn't say serving under. He was serving alongside, in his view. And he was, but what what turned him away from his nationalism at first? Now, there's I would say there's two things going on here. One is that you have new types of legislation, uh, particularly pushed by the the uh, new industries in the north new steel manufacturer, iron manufacturer, uh, textile manufacturer that are uh, pushing uh, protectionist legislation, meaning that they want to they want to give a boost to these American industries um, at, and uh, to, to stop all these British in British products that are coming into the country because we want to build our own industry in order to do that um, in the in, in the 1828, they passed this tariff that was called the Tariff of Abominations, which uh, raised really high tariff rates on manufactured goods, manuf textile and imported goods, including textiles, uh, iron, and many other things. Well, this, th this tariff, however, hit the Southern um, slave states uh, negatively. They did not see anything in this for them. And, uh, Part of this was because they had to import, they imported a lot of things, uh, textiles to, to clothe their slaves. They had imported uh, many of them from Britain. And so the tariff increased their costs. It, it raised the price uh, of the goods. And the second way that it harmed them was that they were selling their cotton to these very same British textile manufacturers. So if the Northern uh, textile manufacturers in Massachusetts manage to get a textile uh, a, a protection that diminishes the income of the British textile manufacturers. Then those British textile manufacturers have less money to buy cotton from the southern planters, and uh, so that that was part of the way in which the the um, the trade laws which were passed to benefit Northern manufacturers came at the expense of Southern cotton planters. Uh, and I think that Calhoun was correct about this. This was actually uh, a law that benefited the North much more than the South. Uh, and so Calhoun, now the, the question is, um, uh, what do you do about something like that? If you believe in the principle of majority rule, the solution is you convince enough people uh, outside of the South that this is unfair and have them repeal the law. And that was not, th that law had passed, the Tariff of Abominations 1828 had passed by a very narrow margin. It was not at all uh, unreasonable to think that that could be repealed through the ordinary constitutional majoritarian process. But Calhoun didn't think that was sufficient. And so he, in, uh, by 1828, he had come up with this idea of the concurrent majority, the idea that the, the state of South Carolina 
does not need to wait until it convinces the majority in Congress to stop this awful tariff that's hurting the country. Instead, it will nullify that tariff, which it could do because it had a port. So tariffs were collected in ports. Uh, Charleston, South Carolina was one of the major ports of the United States. So it could just directly nullify that law, or if put it another way, uh, disobey that law. If you believe the law is legitimate, that the whole state of South Carolina would then disobey that law and let all those those foreign goods come in without anybody paying any tariff duties on them. Well, this led to a confrontation uh, with um, the federal government and particularly with President Andrew Jackson, keeping in mind that Calhoun is now a principal political opponent of the second president that he served under or alongside. Uh, he actually wrote came up with all the theory for nullification when he was uh, vice president under Andrew Jackson. They had, their relationship went very sour quickly. By 1831, he came out publicly as the author of this doctrine of nullification, resigned as vice president, and then went to the U.S. Senate. And so originally, uh, now that, that was a, that confrontation over the tariff could have turned violent. It did not. There was, there was a, um, Many a number of senators, uh, including Henry Clay, got together and brokered a compromise tariff and lowered the tariff. Uh, Calhoun was satisfied, and he convinced uh, his state to to uh, to back off. And and I think in certain ways that experience of creating a confrontation and then coming to a compromise uh, convinced Calhoun that this was a workable way to do government, that, that uh, refusing, the minority simply refusing to go along with the law could lead to an outcome that is acceptable to everyone. Now, that was not, however, not the case for the next major issue which came along, which was slavery. And even during the, the, the confrontation over the tariff and over manufacturers, uh, Calhoun and others from South Carolina always had at the back of their mind that they were not just uh, fighting this battle against protectionism. They also saw the possibility of anti-slavery legislation, anti-slavery action on the part of the federal government that could be, uh, would be even more alarming to Southern interests. And what you find from the uh, mid uh, 1830s on until uh, the end of Calhoun's life in 1850 is that sectional confrontations over slavery um, took center stage. These were much more difficult to resolve by any kind of compromise than the tariff was. Then, 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 you know, how much, whether you're going to put uh, uh, tariff duties on imported iron. Um, and in fact, Calhoun did not believe that there should be any compromise. He actually, it's, it's the irony of his, of his uh, philosophy of government is it depends upon compromise. And on the tariff, he was willing to compromise. He understood that the, uh, the iron textile manufacturers of the North had a legitimate point of view. They just were taking it a bit too far. He absolutely rejected abolitionism. He believed it was wrong, destructive, even criminal. Uh, he saw abolitionism the way that people would today see, uh, you know, um, uh, terrorists uh, trying to stir up trouble within somebody else's country. Uh, the uh, abolitionists, um, you know, they, 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 there were, the abolitionists were totally suppressed in the South, uh, but even in the North, their writings could find their way south and slaveholders feared that the slaves would get hold of those writings uh, and those would uh, give them ideas about rising up. So uh, Calhoun was totally opposed to abolitionism. He also saw the, that the, the North um, uh, forming an anti-slavery coalition uh, basically a large political party. He feared a large political party would form that was hostile to the institution of slavery. And uh, it almost never happens in politics that 
the majority of people are are motivated entirely by altruistic considerations. The, the abolitionists were driven by altruism and religious conviction, but they were a small minority, even in the North. Um, what made the anti-slavery uh, coalition potentially powerful was there was no, many Northerners had a strong self-interest, economic and political self-interest, at least in stopping the spread of slavery to new territories. So just let's describe it from this point of view, many of the people who supported uh, anti-slavery parties like the Liberty Party, like the Republican Party, when Lincoln came along, many of them did not have any particular uh, sympathy with uh, African Americans, either free or enslaved. But they did really resent the power of slaveholders. They saw slaveholders as this very powerful, domineering minority that was making itself powerful through uh, unjust, unfair ways and lording it over their fellow white citizens. So you have, through the 18, beginning in the 1830s, and certainly by the end of the 1840s, and especially in the 1850s, you have a strong anti-slavery movement in the North, and it's, that is a growing majority of the population because that's where most of the immigrants came uh, during this period, they came to the North. So Calhoun saw this large majority hostile to the institution of slavery it would be a northern majority and even if it did not directly attack slavery so if you take lincoln for example lincoln and the republican party said it would not do anything to abolish slavery in the states where it existed but it did intend to cut it off uh, and abolish it gradually over a long period of time. Well, from Calhoun's point of view and that of, of South Carolina slaveholders, that was just as bad. That meant that your institution, your way of life had no future. And they saw uh, the idea of, of preventing slaveholders from taking their, what they considered their slave property to all those westward territories, which, which were gonna be the seedbeds of future states. Um, and if slaveholders could not bring their slaves there to the western, to the west, um, then over time, the, the northern free state majority, hostile to the institution of slavery, would get a lock hold. They would never be voted out. And at some point, they would actually put an end to the institution of slavery one way or another. And that was a very realistic scenario. And in fact, that's what Lincoln wanted to do. And from Calhoun's point of view, that was a, a deeply unjust majority. Um, let me just, since I've gotten talking about slavery, uh, one of the ironies, um, one of the inc incongruous things about Calhoun's defense of minority rights is that some minorities counted and others did not. White, slave, wealthy white slaveholders uh, were a minority who he believed were entitled to, to be able to uh, veto, to stop actions of the federal government that they did not like. And they were a powerful minority, they were wealthy, they also controlled the governments of states because nullification can only work if somebody controls the government of at least some states. Well, the African-Americans, both those who were free and the greater number who were enslaved, they were a minority of the population um, nationally. They were actually a majority of the population in South Carolina. They did not have those rights. And Calhoun's answer was that some people are prepared for liberty and some people are not. That's uh, a very, um, that's a, in my view, a deeply unjust answer. That's the answer that he gave. It was also the case that Calhoun um, was very straightforward about how, where you have the institution of slavery, every white person, however rich or poor, can view themselves as an aristocrat, can see themselves with pride. And uh, that is part of what helped his, his system of government, the, the, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, 
uh, for the concurrent majority to work, the interest within a state had to be homogenous enough that you could that you didn't have to have internal vetoes, state, you know, vetoes within vetoes within vetoes. And slavery helped give the white population of South Carolina that sense of common of common interest, of unity, uh, over against this this group that they had enslaved and that was potentially very dangerous. And so, um, you know, of all the, the great problems with Calhoun's uh, um, system of government, the greatest one was that, uh, how do you decide which minorities actually count? Um, you can use Calhoun's system of government it doesn't depend on slavery to work. And as I talk about in the book, I talk, you know, the way in which it had been employed in the former Yugoslavia, Northern Ireland, it was considered for a post-apartheid South Africa. Uh, so it doesn't depend on slavery, but uh, I think in, in Calhoun's case, it functioned better with the institution of slavery to give people the necessary solidarity and clearly stopping anti-slavery action was one of the principal motivations for Calhoun in continuing to push this theory of government um, throughout the whole uh, second half of his life. So he died in 1850. Um, there was a great crisis in 1850 over uh, spread of slavery to the territories, also over California entering the Union as a free state because it was an enormous state. And Calhoun and many others wanted to divide it into a, a northern free state, southern, northern free California and a southern slave state California to keep the balance in the Senate. He died at the point of that crisis over where slavery was going to go westward. So the compromise of 1850 takes place, but it doesn't actually stop the Civil War from occurring as a nation descends into, no. into that. Yeah, the, the compromise of 1850 in many ways was a, a holding action. Right. Right. It, it kept it kept things from blowing apart, but did not resolve any of the issues. Right. And so we got the Civil War by, uh, you know, we got secession, 1860, secession, 1861, after the election of Lincoln. And so Lincoln, during his presidency, is, you know, is, is trying to defend national union, um, mm -hmm. Republican principle, and really, in, in a sense, majority rule, right? Yes. So can you... Uh, Tell us a little bit more about how Lincoln is really defending the founders and, and that, mm -hmm. that founding view of, of majority rule and republicanism, uh, you know, against, you know, ultimately, you know, secession, nullification, yeah. you know, counting views. Well, I would say, you know, what it, Lincoln gave a very thoughtful uh, defense of majority rule in his first inaugural address. And, um, you know, I would suggest that his Lincoln's view of majority rule was very similar to, they, to that of James Madison. He, Lincoln talked about how, uh, in his defense of majority rule in his first inaugural address, he talked about how it, it, a, a deliberate majority uh, that it's um, held in place by constitutional checks and limitations, changing easily with deliberate changes of, of public opinion and sentiment. So it's constitutionally checked, it's deliberate. In that sense, it, uh, what he was describing is comparable to what Madison was, was advocating, although it was under very different conditions than, than uh, Madison was facing in 1787 and, and participating in the Constitutional Convention. Let me describe. I want to, before we get to the war, I think it's really important to look at the election of 1860 because um, this is where you really see, in a sense, the fruit of Calhoun's political philosophy. Uh, Calhoun did not want secession. That, let me explain. He, he defended, he believed that states had a right of secession, but he did not want them to resort to it. He was realistic about how much blood would be shed, how violent and bloody any, su any such separation would actually be. So for Calhoun, he believed the right of secession and, and also slave states threatening secession 
would actually prevent secession because it would it would get the northerners to back down, stop pressing this slavery issue, and we could go back to having mutually beneficial compromises. Uh, that didn't happen. Um, so the the actual trigger of secession and civil war was the election of 1860. And in particular, it was that the slave states did not want to accept the results of the 1860 election. If their candidate, John Breckinridge, had won, um, he got, I think, about 25% of the vote. If he had won, they would have been fine to stay in the Union and would have insisted that the Northern states go along with John Breckinridge's presidency. But uh, they absolutely, they believed and in many ways shaped by Calhoun's political theory that they were not obliged to respect the results of an election that was motivated by a view of slavery that they basically rejected. And moreover, uh, they declared, in a sense, secession was declaring the, the 1860 election itself illegitimate in the Southerners' minds. They seceded before Lincoln had even taken office. The, 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 slave, uh, the lower South, uh, South Carolina, Florida, Mississippi, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, Alabama, uh, seceded before Lincoln had even taken office. So they couldn't claim that they, that was in response to anything that he'd done. They were saying, we refuse to, to respect the results of an election of a view that we are opposed to and somebody elected entirely on northern votes. And um, then the, the, it was, now of course, Virginia, uh, Tennessee, uh, Arkansas, uh, North Carolina did not secede uh, as a result of Lincoln's election. In fact, did not consider that a, a a good reason for, for breaking up the Union. Um, it, so in a, in a certain sense, South Carolina's attack on Fort Sumter in April of 1861 <clears throat> was for the purpose of pushing those non-seceding slave states off the fence, of ending the deliberations. Um, this is gonna be one of my main points in the book, the book I'm writing on Lincoln. Lincoln himself did not want a civil war. He believed that slavery could be abolished democratically through majority rule, respecting all the, all the constitutional processes over a long period of time. Um, was that realistic? Well, the, the state of South Carolina certainly considered it realistic. That's the reason why they seceded. They believed that that long, slow squeeze as a way of putting slavery out of existence by a determined northern anti-slavery majority that that could work. And they were not willing to let him give it a try. And so they um, broke up the union before he could take office. And they ended the liberation by uh, uh, initiating a war. And so, um, so, so during the war itself, yes, Lincoln was appealing to majority rule, and he had to keep he had to keep together. It, even the, the majority in the North was very difficult to keep together. It, it required uh, because the, when when Lincoln was elected, he, Lincoln was elected in a three way, uh, sorry, a four way race. Um, you know, he he did not have a majority. He had a plurality, uh, and the Republican Party didn't have a majority in Congress as a result of the eighteen sixty elections. Um, now, he, uh, the, the slave states could see that a majority was, that he didn't yet have a majority, but that was going to happen. At the time, however, Lincoln's majority in Congress depended on the support of Northern Democrats. Uh, and so uh, he did have to appeal to majority rule to keep that very difficult coalition together. Lincoln could have been voted out of office in 1864. I think that's really important. The greatest crisis in American history, he never suggested that elections be canceled or delayed. 
uh, as many other people in power would have suggested. Um, he knew he could, he could be voted out of office. He probably would have been voted out of office if the military situation had not changed um, shortly before. In, in the summer of 1864, the military situation changed for the better and uh, ensured his reelection, but he knew he could be voted out of office. So in that sense, he still, even under the most adverse conditions, understood and, and was committed to uh, governing in accordance with what he understood the principles of the founding, free elections, following constitutional rules, and based on the, the will of the majority. So I would say the lesson that, that one of the points about Lincoln is how committed he was to the processes of free elections uh, as central and and to the legitimate will of the majority and uh, and you know in that sense I, I in this debate between Calhoun and Lincoln I'm on the side of Lincoln uh, I do think that as I mentioned earlier that Calhoun has a number of very important points about how a majority can act unjustly um, there's no guarantee against that um, um, but uh, from Lincoln's point of view uh, a a minority that refuses to give up power to the majority, even through a free election, that's worse than an unjust majority. James Reed, James Reed. Uh, I can't thank you enough uh, for coming on today and discussing everything from the founding up through the 19th century and, and the ideas of John Calhoun and then ending in, in Lincoln and the Civil War. and and even making it relevant to today. So we covered a lot of ground. Thank uh, you. But uh, thank you for your essay uh, in Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. And we look forward to your Lincoln book. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much.